back at Lawrence Hill's apartment, he could spend days going through his collection of black memorabilia. All right, this is 10 Little Nigger Boys, and this book came from England. And the book was very popular there in England, but it also became very popular here in America. Later on, it was changed to 10 Little Indians, the poem, and most kids knew that. But the book uh, featured 10 little black children, and they got themselves into pr some pretty bad predicaments. They start out with 10 of them, and as you can see, one of them got stung by a hive, and he ended up dying. And you keep on going, and eventually there's down to one, and he gets married. And, you know, it kind of, I guess, has a happy ending. But the stereotype of the very dark-skinned black person with the bucked-out eyes and the big red lips, it's still present. And, of course, in England at the time, there weren't many black people, so no doubt this is how English children thought black people really were. This is a tube of darky toothpaste. This was produced in China, and it features the graphics of a black gentleman on it, and he's smiling broadly with a top hat. And the whole point was the contrast of the super bright white teeth against the black skin, and that was very attractive to people in China, evidently. You see the Chinese graphics, uh, letters on it, and this was produced until the late 1980s. They changed the name of it to Darley Toothpaste now, and they changed the graphics slightly so that it's not quite so offensive. As extensive as his collection is, Lawrence would be one of the first people to tell you he is not a pioneer. Blacks have been collecting such items for decades, even if their motivation was different. There are people who were doing it back in the 60s and the 50s. They didn't do it for the value because there was no real value to it. These were things after the uh, black power movement that people were tossed in the trash because they didn't want to see it again. And, or there they were the, the stories, I don't know if they're urban legends or not, of people going into antique stores, buying these items and then throwing them on the floor and breaking them up because they didn't want to see them and they thought they were so demeaning. Williams, the Cleveland State professor, traces the trend back even further. Well, as someone who teaches history, I'd like to think that there's a growing interest in uh, African-American history, but I know that there have been scholars of all races who have uh, worked with Negroes in an earlier period to dig up their past. And I guess one of the, the most famous that will come to mind right now is Arthur Schomburg. Some people refer to him as the Puerto Rican father of African-American history. And I'm sure your viewers will know from the name that he had some German or European ancestry, but also African ancestry and his roots in the Americas uh, in Puerto Rico. But it's in Harlem, in New York, that he really begins to, um, to hone his skills as a bibliophile. So he's collecting books and just about every other piece of uh, material culture related to the Negroes past in America. She says black collectibles are one piece of the puzzle that documents the history of blacks in America. I think the most important thing about those images, no matter how painful they were to folks in the early part of the 20th century, they're part of our history. And so for history buffs and uh, just for laypersons in general who are interested in the story of the American past, you have to include the painful chapters as well as those that really celebrate the role of African Americans in building the country and just being a part of the whole American experience. Lawrence agrees even as he acknowledges that some of the items bring back painful memories. This is history, and this is a very documentable, tangible portion of what has happened in America with black people in popular culture. When you see these items, it, it gives you an impression of what we have had to overcome to become successful in this country. Oftentimes, as you, as you see in some of the items, they're servant figures, smiling people, darky figures, uh, you know, there's all kind of names, jigaboos, you can come up with all kind of names for these items, coons and things like that. But this was, these were the manufactured items that depicted black people here in America. And when you see what you have overcome as black people, because that was the myth of black people, the reality is that we were doctors, we were lawyers, we were senators, we were, you know, politicians, we were teachers and things like that. We weren't all slaves, we were not all cooks and wet nurses and uh, sharecroppers. So it's very important to, to connect to these images and embrace them, I feel, so that you always know and you always can show somebody what it used to be like. And what would Lauren suggest you collect? That is, if you decide you would like to buy these items? I would tell a person to collect what you like, get an interest, maybe a focus, uh, of a maybe you want sheet music or you want 
kitchen items or you want slave items, but don't go at it so much of the monetary value. There are a lot that do that, but as a black person, go after it for mostly the historical value. And therefore, no matter what the prices are in the market, your collection will still have a value historically. And I think that's even more important. Okay, I admit it, I just didn't get it. 10 years ago, a national magazine asked me to do an article on black collectibles. I didn't understand why anyone would want to collect this stuff. Hadn't we fought for years to get rid of these images? The grinning, buffoonish looking men, the overweight mammy types, documents that show many of our ancestors were once property. But the funny thing happened. As I spoke with more and more collectors, my opinion changed. Let me tell you why. When you look at these items, you realize how far African Americans have come. Today, African Americans head some of the same companies that once produced these demeaning images. And some of the most powerful people in the media, which was the biggest promoter of these images, are now African Americans. Here's another reason. It's one thing to have your parents or grandparents tell you about segregation and discrimination, or for us to try to explain that part of our history to our children. It's quite another thing to see the products and documents that were produced during that time. These items make history come alive better than any words in any book. Forgetting our past, no matter how painful the images can sometimes be, would be a big mistake. When you realize how much we've already overcome, that becomes an inspiration for the future. And that can be important when you think about the many problems we still face. For Hope City, I'm Mark Lowry. <laughs>